Hey everybody, Pete Pardo here from Sea of Tranquility. We've got our long-awaited History of Gillen show for you here today. So some of you probably recall, hopefully recall, hopefully have watched it. We did a very extensive History of Deep Purple back a couple months ago. And uh, we've also done a History of Rainbow. We've done a History of White Snake. We've done History of Black Sabbath. You know, kind of all these bands are sort of interconnected, but the one that we've been missing, obviously, is the history of Gillen. So this is going to be centered on Ian Gillen, and I'm not going to go into a lot of his pre-history or history with Deep Purple because we've kind of already gone there. I'll touch on it a little bit, but we're mainly going to talk about from the time that Ian left Purple in 1973 up until basically he joined Black Sabbath. Okay, we're going to touch a little bit on some of the post-Sabbath stuff not relating to Purple, but more of Ian Gillen solo briefly, but mostly we're going to talk about, you know, that 10-year period there. So again, a little bit of back history about Ian Gillen. Uh, born in London in 1945, okay, got himself into music in the uh, early 60s. He wound up joining a pop band called The Episode Six in 1965. He was actually then spotted by the members of Deep Purple later in the decade, roughly in, I believe, early 1969. Uh, while fronting the episode six, um, Purple had released a couple of studio albums, had a big hit with Hush, but they were kind of a little unhappy with their singer, Rod Evans. They wanted to go in kind of a different direction. They wanted to go in a heavier rock direction, and they weren't quite sure that Evans was going to make the cut. So they happened to see Mr. Gillen singing with episode six, they kind of figured, hey, I think that's the guy. We're going to talk to him. And they absolutely did that. And he agreed to join the band, which he did in uh, June of 1969. And of course, brought along bassist Roger Glover, who also played with them in episode six. And they formed the uh, Mark II um, lineup of Deep Purple. Uh, basically, he released six albums in his initial run with Deep Purple. Uh, those include Concerto for a Group Orchestra, In Rock, Fireball, Machine Head, Who Do We Think We Are, Made in Japan. Okay, by June of 1973, you know, the band had been touring nonstop for those three plus years, nonstop. Uh, he and Richie Blackmore also did not get along very well at all. So it was a combination of that. They were having some management issues, and I think Gillen had just said, you know what, I'm burnt out. I'm tired of fighting with this guy, and we're getting ripped off by the uh, the, the management company. i got to get out of here. So he wound up leaving the band in, like I said, June of 1973 uh, to go take some time away from music. Uh, also, I want to mention, too, he did also appear in 1970 on the Jesus Christ Superstar soundtrack album. Did a fine job on that, too, I might add. So uh, after Purple, he takes a long break. He winds up getting involved in, like, some non-musical things. He winds up, uh, you know, with a uh, buying an interest in a hotel as well as some kind of motorcycle project. Neither one, neither one of those took off. In fact, they were both disasters, which led Ian to rethink kind of what he was doing with his life and his career. Uh, and at a chance appearance at the Butterfly Ball in 1974 where he was asked to appear to actually replace Ronnie James Dio, who uh, couldn't appear. That kind of got the musical juices flowing again, and Ian decided, you know, hey, well, maybe I need to kind of jump back and get back into music, put together a new band, right? Because join, rejoining Deep Purple is not going to happen, obviously, because they had uh, David Coverdale and Glenn Hughes in the bands, and they were doing very well for themselves. So he goes to form the Ian Gillen Band, which was actually put together in 1975. The original lineup of the Ian Gillen Band was uh, guitarist Ray Fenwick, okay, Mike Moran on keyboards, uh, eventually Mickey Lee Soul, remember from Rainbow, and uh, Colin Towns would join on keyboards. Colin Towns would be the kind of premier guy on keyboards for a few years. Um, Mark no Nassif, I don't know how he says that, on drums, and uh, John Gustafsson on bass. And John, very well known from his time with Roxy Music, Quatermass, uh, as well as the hard rock band Bullet. So a you know, formidable, formidable lineup for the most part. So they would go to release a couple of uh, three studio albums. Uh, Child in Time in 1976, Clear Air Turbulence in 77, and Scarabus also later in that year in 1977. Kind of a different beast, though, from Deep Purple, and I think a lot of the fans, while happy to see him back singing and fronting a band again, they were a little questionable about the music that the Ian Gillen band was producing, which was kind of like a jazz rock style band with vocals. 
So again, at the time, you know, we're looking at the mid seventies, you had bands like Return to Forever and Weather Report, Tony Williams, Lifetime, Mahavishnu Orchestra, all making lots of waves. And I think, you know, the band, some of these players were really into that style. So Ian kind of let that flow into the music and that's kind of what they created. So we, what do we got here? So we got here's the, uh, the Child in Time album. It's the CD reissue. Not a lot of tunes on here. You know, they do a remake of Child in Time, which is a bit different than the Deep Purple version. Other tunes like Lay Me Down, Pretty Good, uh, Let It Slide, Shame, My Baby Loves Me. That's actually, uh, was a fairly popular tune on the album. But again, um, very different. Solid albums, though, but very different. Uh, this is a twofer, which has a Clear Air, Turbulence, and Scarabus. These are the Ed Soul, by the way, uh, remastered reissues. Wonderful job they did on almost the entire Gillen catalog with all sorts of bonus tracks and things like that. Again, you got some, you know, the, the uh, title track, Clear Air Turbulence, is good. Money Lender, I kind of like. None of these tunes are overly rocking. They got kind of like a jazzy, bluesy feel to them. Very sophisticated stuff. Uh, Scarabus has got a couple of good tunes. Twin Exhausted's good. Uh, Poor Boy Hero is good. Um, Madeleine, I like. Some good tracks. Not incredible tracks, solid albums. Okay, I don't want to downplay these albums because they are pretty good, but I think compared with what was to come, yeah, a little different. Not really what most people would wanted to hear from me and Gillen. Uh, what else do I have here? I also have a live at the Budokan uh, release with the Ian Gillen band, which is which is good. So this has got uh, Clear Air Turbulence, My Baby Loves Me, Scarabus, Money Lender. That's a good tune. I like Money Lender. Uh, Twin Exhausted, Over the Hill, Mercury High, Child in Time, Smoke on the Water, and Woman from Tokyo. So of course, you know, you got to tack on all those purple classics at the end because most fans eh, they weren't really digging the original material this band came up with too, too much. But it's a pretty good live album which I think started that trend to get Ian back into heavy rock music because this, this live album is a bit heavier than the studio albums. So let's see, where are we? So uh, so the three albums are released. He breaks up the band. He was kind of disenchanted with the fact they weren't really making any money, they weren't selling a ton of records, and I think Ian kind of lost interest in that style of music. So he basically breaks up the band, keeps t uh, Colin Towns on keyboards, and forms the, the Gillen Band in 1978. Okay, so Colin Towns stays on keyboards, Steve Bird comes in on guitar, uh, Liam Janaki on drums, and John McCoy on bass. Uh, they released their debut album in Japan, Australia, and New Zealand, in September of 1978. Those are the only places that that album was released, okay, their debut album, which for the rest of the world, you know, obviously we're talking about the late 70s here, not easy to get some imports. So ironically, that album would not resurface, and I don't actually own it, would not resurface until the early 90s, and they called it the Japanese album. Okay, so a little bit of history there uh, in 1994. So shortly thereafter, uh, Janaki leaves after their performance at the Reading Festival. So people were interested in seeing Gillen again, especially in Europe. So he, the, the, the new Gillen band got added to the Reading Festival. They played. Janaki leaves um, that year, and in comes drummer Pete Barnacle uh, to replace him as well. So late in 1978, you know, Richie Blackmore's Rainbow is going pretty well there for a number of years. Ronnie James Dio leaves the band. Richie's in need of a singer. These two guys bump into each other for the first time in years. And I believe how it worked is that I believe Gillen joins Rainbow on stage for a couple songs on a couple nights, maybe at the Hammersmith or something like that. I don't forget the exact place. And Richie, you know, obviously desperate for a vocalist, knows Ian very well, even though they really did not get along well at all. But they had a couple year break there. And he asked if he wanted to join and be the new singer of uh, Rainbow, which Ian obviously turned down because he had his own band going and he probably knew better, right? So um, that job, by the way, eventually went to Graham Bonnet, who was the replacement for Ronnie James Dio and did the Down to Earth album. So in 1979, uh, the band actually secure a European record deal which is big news because they were only their, their previous album. The first album only appeared in uh, Japan, Australia, and New Zealand uh, with Acrobat Records. And uh, Bird is out on guitar, replaced by a guy named Bernie Torme. Okay, pretty, pretty good talent there. Uh, and Barnacle is replaced by Mick Underwood. Mick Underwood, uh, a pretty 
pretty big name at the time. He was with uh, The Herd, with Peter Frampton. He also played with Richie Blackmore in that early 60s band called The Outlaws. And uh, he was also in Episode 6. So obviously Ian knew him very, very well. And he was also in Quatermass. Okay, another fairly notable band who had a terrific, terrific debut album. So the band recorded a new album. It's this one right here. The Excellent, Excellent Mr. Universe. So this came out uh, right in 1979. Basically what they did was because the most of the world had not heard their actual debut, uh, they took a bunch of songs that were recorded on that album and they re-recorded them with the current band and upped the hard rock quote quite a bit. Because Bernie Torme brought this like dangerous, wild guitar style to this band and I think coupled that with the fact that Ian wanted to move back into heavier rock directions, plus that's what the fans wanted to hear, made this a, a much, much heavier affair. If you go online, or if you don't have the, uh, the Japanese album, you'll hear, while that album is a little a bit more rocking than the Ian Gillen band stuff, it's not quite up to what we got here. So this is a screaming great album. I kind of call this the debut. Um, I, I guess technically it's not, but with the Gillen band, as we would know it for a number of years later, this is kind of their debut. So um, Secret of the Dance, great, great tune. Uh, she Tears Me Down. The title track, Mr. Universe, is an epic, epic heavy rock track with great prog rock keyboards and screaming lead guitar from Mr. Torme and screaming vocals from Ian. They, they, those guys were such a match together. Screaming lead guitar, screaming lead vocalist. This doesn't get much better than the Gill and Torme pairing there. Uh, Vengeance is a great driving heavy rocker. What else? Puget Sound, killer, killer hard rock um, tune, Message in a Bottle, Fighting Man, Dead and Night, what else, Second Sight, just great, great, great tunes on here, a, a, an amazingly underrated album, and uh, here we got a bonus track, live version of Smoke on the Water, so this would start to get the band, you know, really noticed, it's like all of a sudden, like, oh, the, Ian's back, the Gillen Band, good stuff. Uh, what else we want to talk about this album? Uh, the album is also released in uh, Japan, Australia, and New Zealand. And, but what they did was, this is interesting. So because they didn't want to put out an almost identical album that they've already, already released down in Japan, Australia, and New Zealand, what they did was they took off the tunes that were reworked from that original Japanese release and they put some newer tunes in. So if you can go find that uh, 1990 CD release of the Japanese album. Not only will you get the original album, but you get all those extras, those extra tunes that were put on to the Japanese release of Mr. Universe. So kind of a cool oddity. I don't know why I don't have that. I got to track that down. So, um, so yeah, so Mr. Universe, great stuff. So, uh, the band at the time, cause you know, we're looking at the start of the eighties here, the band all of a sudden get lumped in with the new wave of British heavy metal movement. So, you know, you got all these British bands coming up with the really this new heavy style that kind of invoked, you know, the hard rock and early metal of the 70s with a little bit of punk, all sorts of influences. You got, you know, Def Leppard and Satan and Iron Maiden and Saxon and all these bands and kind of Motorhead was on the periphery and Angel Witch and Diamond Head, you know, all these bands. So Gillen kind of gets lumped in with those other bands. And you can, you can kind of see why. So uh, their next release comes out that year in 1980. It's called Glory Road. Probably for a lot of people, their favorite Gillen album. And I really can't argue too much. I kind of prefer Mr. Universe a little bit, but man, this album is great too. Uh, a lot of people call it their peak. Uh, and with initial copies of the album also containing... The, would you call it an EP? I mean, there's a lot of tracks on it. It's the For Gillen Fans Only album. Kind of like a fan club type of thing with all sorts of odds and ends and oddities and weirdnesses. But uh, some great stuff on the Glory Road album. Unchain Your Brain. Great rampage and heavy track. Uh, Are You Sure? What else? We, no Easy Way. Great tune. And, and killer, killer. Bernie Torme guitar work on that. In fact, he would, in his solo career, once he left the band, he would do uh, No Easy Way Live quite often. Sleeping on the Job, another memorable, memorable song. On the Rocks, my top three favorite Gillen tunes of all time. Great, great stuff. What else we got here? If You Believe, another one. Nervous, 
that's a very fat, again, that's that's probably the most new wave of British heavy metal track on this album. Nervous is great. And then, you know, you got all sorts of oddities on the uh, For Gillen fans only stuff. Uh, I mean, not not something I listen to quite often because there's some good stuff on there, but a lot of throwaways, a lot of, you know, B-sides and things they were farting around with in the studio. But, you know, good to have if you're a fan. Uh, top two best Gillen albums easily, if not the best. Depends on, you know, how you feel about that. Uh, the band goes and tours the U.S. Unfortunately, they just never really picked on here. They never really caught on here in the U.S. despite trying. Uh, and the sad thing was, you know, those two albums didn't break them here in the States. The tour didn't break them here in the States. But honestly, they weren't really making a lot of money anywhere. Which is kind of, if you when you go and listen to the music of this band, it's kind of a travesty. Because there were a lot of other bands, probably not as good as Gillen, who were making a killing. And Gillen just it just never really happened. And, and, and again, I guess I kind of see it because probably a lot of people just wanted to see him back in purple. So and remember, at the time, there was no Deep Purple. Because after the Come Taste the Band album... Purple was no more. You know, Richie obviously was off in Rainbow. Coverdale would leave to start uh, White Snake. Glenn Hughes was doing solo albums and Hughes Thrall and all over the place. And you had um, Ian Pace and John Lord doing Pace Lord Ashton, Ashton Pace Lord. Um, they would join White Snake as well. Uh, Pace would play with Gary Moore. So there was there was no Purple going on. So I think you had all these offshoot bands. But, you know, and arguably none of them got as big as Purple. But, you know, White Snake and Rainbow did very, very well for themselves. White Snake still does very well for themselves to this day. It's kind of a shame that Gillen's band just never really kind of hit it off. Anyway, so uh, at this time, band releases Future Shock in 1981. You know, still not really getting a lot of mainstream success in most, mar in most markets. This is actually a pretty cool album, though. I love the cover art. Very, very cool if you take a look at that there. Uh, you know, the Future Shock is a good tune. Um, no Laughing in Heaven's good. Sacre Blue is kind of a fun tune. New Orleans is pretty fun. Bite the Bullet. You know, For Your Dreams. Bunch of bonus tracks on here, which is kind of nice with the Edsel reissue. But not as memorable an album, although very strong as the two that came before it. So, you know, some of the cracks are starting to show already. And, uh, you know, this was 1981. So shortly thereafter, Bernie Torme is out. He goes off and decides to do, you know, solo stuff. He actually also briefly uh, winds up in Ozzy Osbourne's band replacing Randy Rhodes, like immediately after Randy passed died in the plane crash. So I, I don't know how many, I forget how many shows it actually was. It was one to three shows, I think, that Bernie filled in. And that, you know, when you really think about it, if you know Bernie Torme's playing at all, I, I, I'm always thinking about what it would have been like if they would have, if Bernie would have stayed in Ozzy's band and continue on and maybe done the, you know, Speak of the Devil album. You know, I know all the Brad Gillis fans are thinking, God forbid, because that album is perfect as it is. And, you know, maybe staying instead of Jakey e. Lee coming into the band, you know, having it be Bernie Torme. You know, he's wild style guitar playing. And, you know, maybe he's a little more blues based. Maybe that's the reason why it didn't really work. But kind of interesting to think about it anyway. So, um, so Torme is gone. They bring in white spirit guitarist Yannick, Yannick Gers. Of course, you know him as being the third guitar player in Iron Maiden for got 20 some odd years now uh so this was late 1981 so yannick joins the band they re released a double live studio set called double trouble in late 1991 this is a pretty damn good one this for me is a kind of return to form after the um future shock album again not a bad album but i think this album is a little bit better uh, i'll rip your spine out restless is a great tune men of war is awesome uh nightmare is great born to kill they also, on this uh, reissue from Edsel, they have all sorts of live tracks recording at the Reading Festival in 1981 with this exact lineup. So pretty cool. A lot of good tunes on here. Um, and of course, uh, ending it all with Smoke on the Water. You got Vengeance, Mr. Universe, On the Rocks. On the Rocks is great, great tune. So a very good tune. I mean, a very good album with live and studio tracks both. So good stuff. So, where are we at here now? So, August of 1982, out comes the Magic Album, which would be the last ever Gillen Band album. Uh, a decent album. Perhaps the weakest of the bunch. 
Um, let's see. After the tour of Magic, the band go on hiatus for Gillen to have surgery to remove nodes in his vocal cords. He would actually go and take out some nodes from his vocal cords and his tonsils, right? And the band kind of waiting around for Ian to recuperate so they can kind of continue on. But anyway, the album, what's on the album? So What's the Matter is a good tune. Uh, Bluesy Bluesy I like is a really fun tune, catchy tune. Caught in a Trap is good. Uh, Driving Me Wild, Demon Driver. What else? Living for the City. Kind of a cool tune, Stevie Wonder tune. I, I like the way they did it. And then a bunch of bonus tracks on here, which is kind of nice. Uh, then doing a cover of Health or Skelter, Smokestack Lightning, a bunch of other things. But... So the band are basically waiting around for Ian to recuperate, and Ian winds up hanging out in a bar with Tony Iommi and Geezer Butler, who of course need a vocalist because Ronnie James Dio and Vinnie, Vinnie Appice on drums have both left the band. And these guys get hammered. Ian wakes up the next morning with a hangover. He talks to his agent, and the agent's like, congratulations on your joining Black Sabbath, right? So before now, all of a sudden, Ian Gillen is the lead singer of Black Sabbath. They go on to record the Born Again album. They go on a major world tour. Of course, it only lasts about a year and a half, but meanwhile, the Gillen guys were never told that all this was happening. They were waiting for Ian to come back so they can, you know, make another album, do some more touring, and that never happened. In fact, it was never they were never even notified that the Gillen band was no longer, which of course caused a lot of resentment for many, many years. After that, in fact, John McCoy, I believe, still would will not speak to uh, Ian Gillen to this day, which is kind of a shame. Uh, he, John McCoy, actually would go on to work with Bernie Torme quite a bit in the future. They would have the GMT band, and um, you know the other guys in the band will go off and do all sorts of other stuff. So, yeah, basically that's kind of it for the Gillen band. Uh, what else do we got here that I can show you? So this is the Triple Trouble live three CD set. Okay. Pretty cool stuff. This has got the live at the uh, live at the Rainbow gig from '81, live at the Reading Festival again from '81. So I got that a few times here. Uh, some BBC uh, radio sessions and things. Some live in Nottingham, Rock City tracks. Pretty cool live set. What else? What else we got here? Okay, so later in the decade, and exactly when this? So actually, no, it was in the '90s. So in the early '90s, um, Ian had done a couple solo albums. So this was kind of in between because he was out of Purple late 80s for a couple of years and then he rejoined but he, he would so he was doing some solo stuff then as well as some solo stuff while he was in purple so this is the um what do we got the naked thunder album toolbox and the uh Cherkazoo stuff the Cherkazoo stuff goes back to i believe the 70s and the early 80s uh, i will say the naked thunder and the toolbox albums are pretty damn strong Cherkazoo stuff is kind of weird, some oddities and things like that. But these other two albums are very strong, kind of like metallic hard rock albums, you know, early 90s hard rock albums, with Ian probably right at the tail end of still being able to have that very strong uh, vocal presence and screaming up a storm. Some really good, hard, heavy rock albums of uh, songs on these two albums. So this is a good one to have. What else? Um, this is pretty cool. And again, uh, oh, let me go back to this again. So this is the Gillen and Glover album, Accidentally on Purpose. These guys went to the uh, down to the Caribbean, if I remember correctly, to do an album, and it's kind of like a breezy pop rock album. Not really indicative of either guy, but kind of a fun curiosity, I think. Some good strong tunes on here, and I think the guys really enjoyed doing this album. This was done when exactly was this recorded? Is this in the early '90s, late '80s? I honestly I don't remember. Let's see if it says so in here. Uh, 19. Let's see. What do we got? Come on, tell us here. Tell us. Accidentally on purpose. When did this come out? Yeah, you know what? There's probably probably some of you out there know it better than I do. I don't remember. I've only got this one real recently. I stayed away from it for the longest time because I heard you know read a lot of strange reviews of it and how it's very unlike what both those guys do. But anyway, uh, what else here? Live at the BBC, 1982 CD set from the Gillen Band. This is another pretty strong one. All sorts of cool stuff on there. And uh, Gillen's Inn, which was a uh, solo album he did in, oh, what year was this again? Is this the late 90s, I believe? I think this is the late 90s. Uh, and this is the uh, the deluxe edition. So here he kind of went back and re-recorded some classics from uh, his you know earlier part of his career. So what do we got on here? We got... Um, uh, trashed from the Born Again album with Black Sabbath. We've got um, Bluesy Bluesy. 
um, Hang Me Out to Dry, Men of War, Smoke on the Water, uh, No Laughing in Heaven, Speed King, Living on Borrowed Time. Yeah, all sorts of stuff. So he kind of goes back in with a, with a whole bunch of his friends. There's all sorts of musicians who appear on here and help him out. And it, this is actually a really fun release. You know, again, his voice, not what it was at by this time, but still a pretty cool album. And then there's uh, this Who Cares thing with Ian Gillen and Tony Iommi. So this, uh, they basically did like a little, they did a bunch of, a couple tunes together as a, to raise some money for a uh, charity. And uh, this has those couple tunes on here. You know, John Lord was involved in that as well as Nico McBrain from, uh, from Iron Maiden. Uh, as well as some kind of cool things that uh, these these guys did together over the years. Pretty neat. There's a whole bunch of things on here. Out of My Mind, Zero the Hero, Trash, Get Away, Slip Away, uh, Easy Come, Easy Go, Smoke on the Water, Can't Believe You Want to Leave, No Laughing in Heaven When a Blind Man Cries. Yeah, some cool stuff. Out of my head, out of my head, I believe was the tune they did together back. Uh, oh, geez, was that about six, seven years ago now? I forget exactly. But anyway, a cool curiosity thing. So that's my Gillen show, guys. Um, you know, a very noteworthy act. Uh, I dig them quite a bit, and I think if you're a fan of Purple, uh, you know, I think if if you're here in North America, which obviously I am from, uh, when I was you know, a young guy, and I was just getting into purple and, uh, you know, rainbow and white snake and what have you, Sabbath and all that kind of stuff in the late 70s, early 80s. Uh, you know, the Gillen band was was going strong. Maybe not, they weren't like a worldwide hit, like some, like, you know, like those other bands. But uh, here in North America, man, I, I don't remember ever seeing any Gillen albums anywhere. Uh, you didn't hear about them much. They you, they didn't really talk about them much in like the uh, you know the rock and metal music magazines. So like I very I, I don't remember ever seeing them in Cream or Hit Parader or Circus Magazine and that kind of stuff. So they basically they were making waves like in Europe, but not much was happening here, which was a real shame. And they, I don't remember seeing the import albums or anything like that. So but it's funny listening and getting into the Gillen band. You know years later, I didn't start exploring Gillen the Gillen stuff until probably uh, in the nineties. You listen to it and you're like, God, how did how was I not completely into this back in the late 70s, early 80s? It's just kind of a shame and these things happen, right? So, uh, but better late than never. I, I have been enjoying the hell out of these albums for the last, you know, 20, 20 some odd years. They're they're awesome. So, uh, one of my favorite singers of all time and, and a great, great band, the Gillen Band. Uh, Ian Gillen Band, nothing to slouch at. Some of the solo stuff afterwards, still really good too. But it's that Gillen Band, those couple of albums, man. Great, great heavy stuff that deserves your attention. So anyway, this is on the web at www.catranquility.org. We're on Facebook. We're on Twitter. Of course, we're here on the Mighty YouTube. we got a lot of cool stuff coming up. Uh, I am going to try very hard to do that History of Blue Oyster Cult show tomorrow. If not tomorrow, it's going to happen someday during the week. So be on the lookout for that. i uh, got some new product stuff coming up. Gonna cooking up some rants, all sorts of things. So till then, take care. Make sure you go and check out all the uh, old videos in the library. Make sure you subscribe and tell your friends, and we'll see you real soon.